Carluck was really awesome. He um, he would run into a blowdown, and turn and look at me, and if I didn't start going over the blowdown, he would come up behind me and nudge the back of my knee with his head gently to kind of keep me going. This is the Adventure Sports Podcast, where we hear stories of adventure from every corner of the planet. We interview all sorts of folks who are using their sport to explore the world around them and give you the inspiration you need to get out there and have some fun. Hey folks, hope you're having a good one. I know it's a crazy week in the world right now. And I just want to take this chance to say I hope you're using your voice to make a difference. Hope you're taking action. I am a big proponent of taking action when you see something in the world that you don't like, something that you think needs to change, and that's only going to happen through action. So going to today's episode, this is a Throwback Thursday episode. Uh, Travis is doing it. This is, goes back to, I think, in the 100s, and it's through hiking with dogs, and it's with Whitney all good Larufa, and he is uh he did a through hike of the Appalachian Trail took his dog and I know this is you know I know with so much going on in the world I was like you know should we post this but you know one thing we can agree on when uh when times are crazy is that our, our pets and to me I'm, I'm partial to dogs you know if you're like cat person you know that's that's cool I love dogs and uh you know it's like dogs make us happy dogs bring us together dogs unite and, you know, I think a lot of people have dreams of doing adventures with dogs. I'll tell you what, my dog's been aggravating the mess out of me lately. And I took her backpacking a couple weeks ago. And it's it's like our relationship was healed. She's a little old Border Collie uh, lab mix, about 40 pounds and just a ball of energy. And it aggravates me to death because she runs around the house first thing in the morning, wakes up the baby. And I spend most of my time aggravated with her. But when we went hiking, it was like, it was exactly where she needed to be in the world and exactly where I needed to be too. And I don't know, we're just so much closer after that little hike a few weeks back. And so we've been doing so much more together. And, uh, you know, I, I just been thinking about it and how much I, th- those dogs mean to me, my, both of my dogs, but one doesn't like the hike. He's kind of lazy. But anyway, I'm really rambling. I, I, I just want to reiterate, get out there, make a difference and enjoy this episode and please keep sitting uh people you think that would make a guest for the show we've gotten a lot of referrals lately and darn near every one of them is an excellent referral so please if you got somebody in mind reach out mason at adventure sports podcast.com all right talk soon Hi, welcome back to the Adventure Sports Podcast. This is your host, Travis. With me today is Whitney LaRufa, also known as All Good. And because All Good is a trail name, you probably already figured out that Whitney is a through hiker. Um, Whitney has a pretty long list of accomplishments I'm looking at here. Uh, back when he was 18 in 1996, he did his first through hike of the Appalachian Trail. Uh, after that, he apparently kind of latched on to a, a love or discovered a love for it because he went on to be a ridge runner for the Appalachian Trail. He section hiked the Allegheny Trail. He summited Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams, and Mount Hood, all in the Cascades. He also through hiked the John Muir Trail, the Wonderland Trail, and he's done a Timberline Trail through hike. Uh, Tahoe Rim Trail, and he's uh, currently kind of working on section hiking the PCT. But where we caught up with him is in the middle of the Continental Divide Trail. So Whitney, we found in Pine, Colorado, taking a little bit of a break and resupplying before he uh, keeps en route. But he's been doing this for two months now, uh, hiking from south to north. So Whitney, thanks for uh, joining me and welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Travis. Yeah, it's pleasure to be here. Absolutely. So I love catching up with people in the middle of their their hike. I mean, you guys, everything is fresh in your mind. You're experiencing it right now. Like I said, you're in the middle of a of a resupply in Pine uh, before you you head out again. Um, yep. You started two months ago uh, to today, I believe. Um, down yeah, just about yeah. April eighteenth, we started uh, down at the border in Crazy Cook. Okay, yeah. So you've been on the trail two months, and I was looking through your blog. You're keeping a, a blog, and for those that want to follow along as they're uh, listening to this, you can check out uh, Whitney's blog at the DagoDiaries.com. That's yep. D A G O Diaries.com. 
Um, so Whitney is uh, keeping an up-to-date blog. And if you guys have ever thought about hiking uh, the CDT or any through hike, this is an awesome resource just to go get a feel for what it's like, uh, you know, a day in a life of a, a through hiker. So check out his blog and uh, see his accomplishments. Oh, thanks. Yeah, so. thanks a lot. Yeah, it's not, uh, it's not easy. And sometimes you're writing that blog at night and you're like, God, is this boring people? I'm just talking about like what I did for the day, but uh, the folks at home seem to tell me that they appreciate it and they, they like to see that it, a snapshot of what it's really like out there day after day. So it's no, not all unicorns absolutely. and fairy tales. It's a, uh, it's hard work and some days you're going to suffer a little bit. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I saw where you're post holing through uh, some pretty deep snow, even here in June. That's uh <laughs> You know, that's kind of rough. <laughs> Get up there and you know, everything's, uh, it's about 102 degrees down here in Boulder. And then you find out, uh, find out you got a ton of snow up there to, to deal with. So, but I guess you're kind of prepared for that stuff. You know what you're dealing with. Yeah. I mean, you kind of know what you're dealing with, but still, I mean, I'm a I'm kind of a shorter, heavier through hiker. And uh, when you're post hole it all day with snowshoes on, it times up to your waist. It gets pretty frustrating after a couple hours. Yeah. I'll bet slogging through that stuff. It gets exhausting. <laughs> Yeah, we're ready for the snow to be gone. We're, we're happy to see this heat wave show up in the last week. <laughs> <laughs> at least, at least some of us are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're, we're happy in the high country about it. Maybe not down here in the front range. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So let's go back to your beginnings. Um, like I said in okay. your intro, you started out at 18 years old. You decided to, I guess it was uh, take a little time off before you you went to college, and you wanted to through hike the the AT, and you're from that area. So let us mm-hmm. in on that a little bit. Uh, paint a little picture of your background and how this all started yeah i think i grew up mostly in new england my whole life until i was in high school but um very active in boy scouts growing up and um when i did a lot of stuff in the white mountains growing up and learned about the appalachian trail and at like 14 i really wanted to hike the appalachian trail and my parents were like well you're 14 you're not leaving home to go hike um so they kind of made a deal with the devil that if i could graduate early and still go to college on time and pay for it myself i could go hike the appalachian trail so, um, for four years in high school, I didn't have lunch and I graduated semester early in high school and I worked a job at night as a restaurant, as a bus boy, and then as a cook and, um, came home every week, gave my mom the money saved up. And, uh, yeah, when I was 18, I took off from home in March and, uh, finished hiking three days before I had to get to college at Virginia tech. Man, so, that's some serious um, motivation. <laughs> yeah. I guess I've always been a pretty, uh, goal orientated, motivated individual but um it was just something that i really wanted to do in life and it was just it, to me it seemed like kind of the be all end all and um i just something knew i had to do it so you know i put a lot of hard work in it to get to that point but you know i have no regrets looking back on it, it's the best decision i ever made because it uh really changed my life for the rest of my life and really kind of set set a precedent of what i would get involved with um you mentioned earlier i was a ridge runner for two years on the appalachian trail uh virginia tech at the time maintained 47 miles of the appalachian trail and I was the trail boss for three years for the Outdoor Club of Virginia Tech. Um, so from a pretty early age on in 1996 on, I've been heavily involved in long distance hiking in one form or the other, whether as a hiker or as a volunteer maintaining trails and helping other hikers get out there. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, you've definitely built a, built a life on educating people about uh, through hiking as well. I see you're uh, president of the American Long Distance Hiking Association, uh, the Western I am. Division. Yeah, so that's oh, actually, cool. Actually, we are our own organization. We're the American Long Distance Hiking Association West, and uh, we're the home of the Triple Crown Award. And a previous guest you've had on, Liz Thomas, Snorkel, uh, she's our vice president, and she's currently filling in for me while I'm out here through hiking, so... Oh, very She's cool. She's kind of keeping the ship afloat while I'm away. So. <laughs> well, good for that. Yeah, we have, Liz is kind of a veteran on the show at this point. Uh, oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. I've listened to a couple of her episodes, and uh, yeah, she's just a great person. And uh, like a little sister to me, it's been really nice to be able to step away for five, six months and do a hike and know that everything on that front's being taken care of without having to worry about it. Yeah, that's cool. You guys all seem to have a, a kind of a tight knit community between all you guys. You're one way or another, you're connected, and that's a, that's kind of envious. I think that's a, that's very cool to see. Yeah, it's a it's a the long distance hiking world's a very unique uh, place because I think it takes people from all different walks of life and backgrounds. And um, you know, hiking is kind of the great equalizer. And Mother Nature doesn't care who you are, how much money you made, or what you did. Once you're out there, you're all subjected to the same things, and um, I think you really just appreciate simple things in life. And that's what kind of brings us all together. Yeah, absolutely. So, and then people, you know, certain people you just gravitate towards and they become like family. And, uh, you know, Liz and I, two years ago, pioneered the Chinook trail through the Columbia river gorge. And, uh, you know, we did like a 300 mile hike. No one had ever done before. And, um, that was a pretty big bonding experience spending, you know, 10 days doing 30 mile days and 
not knowing where the next water source was or the next resupply was and just kind of making up as we went along kind of gives, gives a pretty strong bond with two people. Yeah, sure. Yeah. She was telling us about that Chinook trail. That's uh that's gotta be a, an experience. I mean, one, it's one thing to go out and through hike one of these trails. There's a lot of prep and a lot of thought to go into it and certainly a lot mm-hmm. of exertion, but to go pioneer one of these things, like you said, not knowing where your water uh, sources are and, and whatnot, it's got to add an extra element of excitement for sure. Yeah, it definitely takes it from being kind of a walk in the woods and kind of like a walk in the park to really kind of more of an adventure and almost like expedition in some ways, you know, and um, there was times we ran out of water and it was really hot and you just kind of had to put your head down and trudge through for eight or 10 miles with no water and hope the next horse was going to be running when you got there. So, um, but it was a lot of fun. It was a great adventure and um, memories I think both of us will have for the rest of our lives, really. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. All right. So let's go back to the, to the AT, your first through hike, uh, fill us in on that a little bit. Some of your experiences, maybe some stories, good or bad. And then there's a fun story about how you got into the, to the whole hiking with dogs, uh, scenario. Yeah. I mean, it was, um, it was good. You know, I started out with a group of eight people on the Appalachian trail and by the third day there was three of us left. Um, so kind of the classic story of, you know, the Appalachian trail eating its young, um, we had quite a bit of snow in 96 was one of the wettest years in the Appalachian trails history. So my third morning I started out, I remember this old man rolled over and he's like, it's going to snow today. And I was like, dude, we're in Georgia. It doesn't snow in the South. <laughs> and uh, by the end of that day, I was post holding up to my crotch in deep snow from a blizzard. And um, it snowed for three days. So the Appalachian trails a really good, like learning lesson. Um, I started with an 85 pound pack and uh, quickly got it down to about 35 pounds. Dang. So, <laughs> Uh, you know, no matter how much you think, you know, I guess you're always going to learn something. And, um, the AT taught me a lot of lessons about myself and really helped me grow up in life. I don't think I ever would have graduated college if I hadn't gone and hiked the Appalachian Trail first. Cause, um, it really set the tone for, you know, knowing that no matter what you put your head to, you can really accomplish in life. Um, met a lot of characters along the way. I think through hiking's really changed in the last 20 years that the people that used to through hike in the nineties were kind of the scallywags and scofflaws of society. Um, they were definitely not like in athleticism. It was definitely more about the the journey and the experience, kind of like the Dharma bums where, uh, 20 years later when I'm in the hiking community, I feel like I'm, I'm in an ultra marathon event with some of the people that are there and how athletic they are and the miles they can pull. Um, so it's really a, quite a bit of a change. Um, met a lot of crazy people along the way. Um, spooky boy was kind of a, a famous AT figure for a long time. <laughs> He, um, boy. <laughs> he rolled up to a shelter one time at midnight and started yelling at us, calling us a bunch of punks and telling us to get out of his shelter. And then just like that, turned off his flashlight and disappeared in the night. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we had some crazy experiences. Um, pretty famous trail icon who recently passed away. Actually hiked with me in 96. Baltimore Jack was a kind of a staple and a figure on the Appalachian Trail for 20 plus years. And in uh, the 90s, he was still hiking. So I, I hiked a fair amount with him in the 90s. That was a lot of fun. Um, and just met some really great people. Um, I think one thing you were alluding to there, when I was in Tennessee, um, I found a dog that had been following my friends through the Smokies um, in the town of Irwin. They had brought him into Irwin, and I had shown up right behind him. And they were like, either the dog leaves tomorrow with a hiker or it's going to the pound. And um, so I went ahead and took that dog with me. And, um, actually hiked with him all the way up to the main border. And then my parents came and got him and, and took him home so I could finish up and not have the hassle of not having a dog in Baxter and trying to arrange like a flight to get him home and everything. Um, but from there, me and that dog spent two summers on the Appalachian trail ridge running together. Um, he went to college with me, brought him out West. We, uh, did some mountaineering together. Um, hiked a lot in the Northwest and the goat rocks and, um, Indian heaven wilderness areas, Mount hood wilderness areas, and, um, really just having him in my life, um, gave me a little bit more responsibility, something else besides myself to be responsible for, which I think was good, but it also really started this whole love of spending my time in the outdoors with my dogs. And, um, so I had that dog for 13 years and we probably hiked five or 6,000 miles together. And, um, it was some of the best times of my life, just having me and my dog and just being out in the big wild road together is a lot of fun. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, I was looking at uh, at uh, Irwin's page too, and uh, Irwin's mm-hmm. got some accomplishments too. Like so he's sitting there with a, a can of Guinness in the picture. That's uh, that's prime. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah, it's a classic photo of him. I mean, I I think the nice thing was, you know, um, you know, I got him. He was probably two or three years old, and I had him for thirteen years. So we had a lot of really good years of hiking. But the last three years of his life, I just kind of 
let him not carry a pack and retire. And we just kind of hung out together and, you know, went, went rafting and canoeing and just kind of chilled out at home and he'd sit in the backyard with me. So he's just a great dog really all around. And, um, you know, it was a lot of fun to spend a lifetime with him in the woods. That's cool. Well, he was definitely lucky to find you for sure. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks. So what about the, um, you know, some highs and lows of the AT? Um, you got, you have done a, uh, quite a few through hikes of various trails. Um, mm-hmm. one, I like to hear kind of, you know, people's personal comparisons of them, their thoughts between them. But, uh, but some of the specific stuff from the AT, uh, some good stories or, or experiences from that trail. Um, I mean, you know, it was a long time ago. I mean, I guess, you know, that, that experience, it was good. I, I guess some of the lows were, you know, it's hard to think of lows 20 years later because I think time, uh, it's all highs, forgives right? all, yeah, <laughs> forgive, forgives all grievances. But, um, when we got in Vermont, it was really, really wet. I mean, Vermont's kind of known as Vermud and, um, we had a lot of rain. Um, no, we, we only saw the sun one time in the whole time we were in Vermont and that was in Manchester center when we were actually at a hostel, the sun came out. Um, so just our luck the day we're in town and actually is sunny. Um, that was kind of a low. We hiked through a hurricane at one point. We were hiking through knee deep water coming down the trail, like a river at us. Um, that got pretty old pretty quick. And, um, actually my hiking partner kind of had a little bit of a breakdown. Um, the day before we get to Hanover and broke a hiking pole against a tree, just almost couldn't take it anymore. Um, so I think that was probably a low point for us. Um, when we got to the top, when we were in the white mountains, that was probably, it was a high point and a low point at the same time. We had some pretty gnarly weather going through there. Um, but the day we got to Lake at the Clouds Hut, we had done 17 miles already. And because we had a dog, they wouldn't let us stay in the hut, um, even in the dungeon downstairs in the basement. So me and my hiking partner actually had to hike all the way to the summit of Mount Washington that, that late afternoon evening. And um, we convinced the last shuttle van going down Mount Washington to give us a ride. <laughs> and uh, we got a ride all the way down to Pinkham Notch. And um, – I called a friend I hadn't spoken to in four years that lived about 30 minutes away in North Conway. And he actually came and picked us up in his mom's car and took us to their house. And his mom did her laundry and cooked us dinner. And we hung out with them. And the next morning, this is a great story. The next morning, we got up and we we're like, hey, man, will you drive us back to the top of Mount Washington? Because we have to have continuous steps. And he's like, I will. But don't you ever tell my mother I drove her car up here. <laughs> And fast forward 15 years later, him and I live in the same neighborhood in Portland, Oregon now. And three years ago at Christmas, I told his mom that story and he still got in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Sucker. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, I think the highs of the Appalachian Trail, I mean, really was, you know, a lot of the people we met in 96 was kind of a, the first one of the first really big years on the 18th. I think they had like 2,000 people start. Um, so really getting to meet a lot of people and people from different walks of life and Different experiences, I think, as at 18 is very impressionable. Um, met some guys who worked in Antarctica. Um, that was pretty inspiring. Um, you know, had a buddy who was an investment banker. Um, and some, you know, people are lifelong friends, people I still keep in touch with. Um, I think some of the highs, you know, in the AT, definitely like going through Max Patch and the Rhone Highlands down in Virginia and the Wild Ponies. Um, that was just such a great area. But I think more for me than anything was just – you know, being away from home my first time, learn to be independent, learn to be self-sufficient. I mean, that was really, for me, at the end of the day, when I look back at the AT, that's really like the highlight for me, is that it, it made me grow up and kind of become an adult at an early age, but in a good way. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why I was curious about it and I asked that question, because you did do it quite young, you know, by comparison. Mm-hmm. A lot of people do wait. Um, and that's, uh, you know, the experience has got to be completely different, you know, than going out there at, you know, 35, 40 years old and, and tackling it. You have a different, uh, uh, view on life for sure. Yeah. And, you know, I think at 18, it's, it's easy to power through things and, uh, you know, just kind of tough it out, you know, because, you know, you're young and you just don't know any better. Um, it's a lot different hiking 20 years later. I can tell you that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and also, I mean, but, there's, but you also hike smarter, I think. I think I hiked this trip a lot smarter than I hiked the AT. <laughs> well, you had an 85-pound pack. <laughs> yeah, that that's part of it. But I think also just like efficiency of walking in itself. Um, I think when you're in your, you know, your teens and your 20s, you can power through it, you know, four miles an hour for two hours, take an hour break and do the same thing. And, you know, when you get in your later 30s, you know, you got to kind of settle the pace back, run at 85%. And um, just try to be as efficient as possible. And I think that makes a big difference in hiking and the, the miles you can do in the endurance you're able to endure. 
Yeah. Yeah. Good point. That's kind of indicative of, of growing older in general, in life in general. <laughs> pace yeah, I mean, pace yourself really and get through. Is, yeah. Through hiking really is, is kind of like a commentary on life, I guess, in a lot of ways. <laughs> right. So I got to ask uh, everybody, of course, how did you get your name? All good. Uh, you know, in the nineties, like it's all good. was a pretty big catchphrase. <laughs> of course. And I said it a lot. And, um, so that's kind of how it became my trail name. But I really think if, you know, people who know me know that, you know, I just kind of rolled the punches. I don't let too much rattle me anymore in life. And, um, I mean, it really is all good. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, my, my theory is as long as you got a relatively flat place to sleep and then it's dry, you got a warm meal and clean water and you're like 90% better than most of the world. Yeah, no doubt. Could be and, a heck of a lot worse. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, you know, people, you know, out there, I mean, it's tough. I mean, it's times, you know, everybody wants to complain about hiking and whatever on a through hike, but the reality is it is all good. I mean, you're out doing what you love and, uh, even a bad day is still better than the best day I ever had sitting in a cubicle. So, I mean, it's kind of a cliche, but it is really the truth, you know, so it is really all good out there. There's a reason why it's cliche. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly. True. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. All right. Let's talk about dogs on the trail a little bit more. So Irwin yeah. is the one you found in Tennessee and yep. uh, did a ton of hiking with him. Eventually he retired and, and has passed, of course. Uh, yep. Um, and then you went on the Appalachian trail still to the day. Oh, really? Oh, uh, that's awesome. Very yeah. Cool. I, uh, I went to Virginia Tech for college and, uh, him and I spent a lot of time at McAbee's Knob um, hiking during the week and stuff when I was in school. So after he passed away, I went back with his ashes a year later and, uh, me and two of my buddies from college who actually knew him really well, uh, climbed up McAbee's knob and spread his ashes off the top of it. So oh, that's awesome. He's smiling kind of a down. Fitting goodbye. Yeah. Totally. Yep. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of times even out here on the CDT where I feel like he's walking beside me at times. I'm sure that is cool. Yeah. That is cool. So then, uh, Carluck is, uh, is your current dog and you've done a, yeah. a ton of hiking with Carluck. I understand Carluck's not on the, the CDT with you a little bit, a little bit lengthy for, for bringing him out there, but tell me about Yeah. Him. I mean, I guess there's a couple of things. I mean, like, you know, like I always, I get fielded a lot of questions through my other website, uh, all gets canine adventures about taking your dog on a long distance trail. And, um, I think the Colorado trail is probably a nice trail for a dog on a through hike. The AT Tahoe rim trail. There are trails that are nice for a dog, but the CDT, I mean, after walking through New Mexico, I was like, there is absolutely no place for a dog on the CDT. Yeah. On a through hike. I mean, honestly, I have a black lab mix. It's like, it'd be animal cruelty to take him through New Mexico. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You throw on a down, uh, black down coat and go, go trekking through New Mexico. (laughs) Well, and just everything in New Mexico has a thorn and it's trying to poke you and stab you at some point. And, um, you know, I have a friend who started the CDT with a guy who had a dog and he said, in the first 13 miles, the dog had 37 different prickers in him and they had to call the shuttle to come get the dog and take him out. Wow. Ouch. So, um, and the CDT is just a long, hard trail. And, you know, I just didn't think an eight year old dog really needed to put himself through that. Um, you know, dogs are loyal to a fault. They'll go wherever you ask them to and hike themselves to death if you want them to. Um, so as an owner, it's sometimes the harder and better decision to make is to leave them home than to take them with you. Yep. No, it's a good decision. Uh, yeah. Uh, but he's a great dog. He's done the Tahoe Rim Trail with me. Um, he circled Mount Hood a couple of times. He circled Mount Adams, which is a really hard hike. Uh, up in the Pacific Northwest, probably the hardest circumnavigation of a volcano you can do. He's done that a couple of times with me. Um, he's climbed Mount Adams. He's climbed some other peaks with me. So he's just a great, loyal companion dog. And um, him and I do a lot of education work now in the Northwest where we go out and speak to various groups or organizations about hiking with your dog and um, kind of show them how a good dog handler handles a dog and what a good trail dog should be. You know, be friendly and, and obedient and, um, you know, kind of things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, how about some uh, tips or advice for people that are thinking, oh, geez, I never thought about that, you know, hiking, hiking a through hike in these kind of distances with my dog. What are some things that they, they probably should know? Um, I think that one thing that they should know is as hard as a through hike is to do on your own, when you bring a dog in the equation, it becomes that much harder because now you're not only responsible for yourself, you're responsible for the dog. Um, a lot of my friends on hikes we've done together, they always joke with me and say, Man, I never realized how much work it was until I was sitting down eating a snack and you didn't even have your pack off because you were still getting your dog, you know, pack off and food out and water <laughs> out so they could have a break before you really got a break. Um, so, I mean, I don't sugarcoat it. I, I absolutely love the companionship. I love my dog to death. I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, but it is like having a three-year-old child you're responsible for with you at all times. Um, but I would say some tips are if you're going to take your dog out, out um, first thing is really get him conditioned. Um if you have a dog that's a couch potato and lays around all day and doesn't exercise, that dog's not going to have fun when you take them hiking. They're going to get pretty sore. 
Um, so I always tell people kind of start small, you know, start doing some day hikes, get your dog used to the pack, maybe in the afternoons when you're taking them for a walk, um, start putting some weight in there, kind of building up the miles and building up the weight. So they're kind of ready to hit the trail. Um, you know, I think two things important with the pack one, they should never be more than they say 25% of your dog's body weight. I try to keep mine at like 13 to 15% of his body weight. So my dog's 70 pounds. He usually never carries more than nine pounds. Um, and then also if you have a puppy, the big mistake I see with a lot of people is they get a puppy and immediately they want to start putting a backpack on them. And really you shouldn't put a pack on a dog until they're at least a year old because you need to give their, their growth plates time to grow and fuse together. Mm-hmm. Otherwise it can lead to early arthritis if you start putting weight on a dog too young. Um, I would also suggest to anybody taking a dog out in the woods um, to look at protection for their pads. Um, probably the number one thing that, you know, is going to run into problems on your, on a dog hiking is hot rocks, hot sand, something sharp, cutting a pad and prevent the dog from being able to hike. So um, we use booties on a regular basis by rough wear. Um, and if you're going to use booties, I definitely recommend trying to get them on the dog and getting them used to them before you take them out in the woods. Cause the <laughs> first time you put booties on a dog is one of the funniest things you'll ever see. You definitely want to film it. <laughs> oh, you definitely want to film it. And, um, you know, if you have a dog that's very like ball motivated, my dog loves to play ball. So if my trick is when I put the booties on him, even if we're out in the woods, I pull out his tennis ball right away and play ball for like five minutes with the booties on. And, the desire to play ball will far outweigh the the things on their feet to the point where they won't even notice them after a couple of minutes. And then you can just start hiking. That's cool. That's a great idea actually. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, Oh, one other piece of advice I would have is always make sure you carry some of your dog's food and items in your pack because I have personally had my dogs lose two backpacks in their lifetime. And, um, when your dog loses his pack with all of its food, it really stinks when you're having to share your food with the dog for the next three days while you're on, <laughs> out on trail. Especially when you've just brought barely enough for yourself. Right. In the first place. <laughs> exactly. You're both on half rations. It's not a lot of fun. Well, once again, the dog's like a three-year-old at that point. You can never expect them to come back with their lunch bag. <laughs> no, definitely not. And, I, and you know, I think, I think my old dog, Erwin, I think he purposely lost his because he didn't want to wear it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> some, uh, some cat stole it from him back in the woods and he wasn't looking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so how did Carluck get his name? Well, Carluck is the Inuit word for fish um, on the BC coast. But the Carluck River is a very famous river in Alaska for their King Salmon run. And um, before my wife and I got married, I had two of my friends take me to the Carluck River for a float trip uh, for my bachelor party. So we spent 10 days in Alaska floating a river, salmon fishing. And um, I just love that name. It's a really hard name. And um, it's a very unique name. I think dogs should have a unique name. And uh, when we got our puppy... My wife and I argued about what his name should be, and uh, we just determined that Carlick was probably the best name for him. That's good. That's fitting. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. So let's talk about human preparation then. Now we got the dog all outfitted and, and ready to wear his <laughs> booties. Uh, what are some good tips for people that may be, you know, day hikers but haven't tackled a, a through hike yet? You know, I mean, I, I think, you know, I've seen people that go, I'm going to go through hike the Apple Detroit or the PCT, and they quit a job. And they, they, they buy all the gear and they put their life on hold and they go into the PCT and two weeks later they hate it and they're home. Um, so I would think that the biggest tip I would say is if you want to get into through hiking, just like your dog starts small. Um, there's a lot of great through hikes in the U.S. that are 300 miles or less that anybody could do with a job, with a regular you know nine to five job with two to three weeks of vacation. Like the Wonderland Trail in Washington is 97 miles. It's a, it's a week hike. Um, and if you're really thinking about doing a PCT hike or a CDT hike, you know, I would recommend trying to get out for a one to three week hike the season previous and, um, make sure one, you really like being out there day after day. And two, also, it's a good way to shake down all your gear and make sure the kit you think you need to have is going to work for you. Um, and then it's just a matter of really trying to keep yourself in shape. Um, for 16 years, I worked as a lumber broker from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. every day. And um, at lunchtime, I would put a 35-pound pack on my back and I would walk up and down the stairs for 45 minutes in our office to keep myself in shape to be able to go hike on the weekends and do 20, 30-mile days. Really? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think that's part of it. I'd also say, you know, get inspired. I mean, there's so many great trail journals anymore and blogs and 
um, so many great people out there doing great things right now that, um, you know, if you can find somebody that you appreciate their writing style and start reading and following them along, it's a great way to keep you motivated and keep you inspired to do some trips coming up. Um, and I think too, it's like you got, people need to change their mindset. I think people think of a through hike as a six month hike and that's, that's not the reality. I mean, you could do any hike as a through hiker style, you know, basically going one direction end to end and doing it all in one push. I mean, you know, I mean, there's, there's the, like where I live, we have the Timberline trail and the Lua trail. They're, you know, 30 something miles and 40 something miles, but you could go do a through hike of those in the weekend. And it's still a through hike. I mean, you're going one direction, you're doing the whole thing in one push, you know, and you should be proud of that. Not everybody has to walk 3000 miles to complete a through hike. Oh yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, like you said, it's, it's all about the inspiration, you know, go to that, <laughs> like your blog, you know, when I was reading it earlier, um, it's, it's full of inspiration because people can really get a feel for what it is they might, uh, they deal with and about the, as well as the beauty that, that they'll mm-hmm. experience while up there. So stuff like mm-hmm. that, we talked about, uh, Liz Thomas, you know, she and the Continental Divide Trail Coalition just put out the, uh, the best hikes, Continental Divide Trail, Colorado edition. That's a yep. great book, you know, get out there and, and do little sessions sections little pieces of it just to get a taste of it one you know if you're gonna do what the dog take them yeah and liz is doing her urban through hikes now she's gotten really right um really deep entrenched with and um i used to be a big skeptic of those until she came to the northwest and did a couple and i hiked with her a couple different days and i was like you know what this is a great way for someone who maybe doesn't want to have to go sleep out in the woods and dig a cat hole in the morning to experience the same kind of mileage and elevation as a through hike, but do it in a different way that, you know, is a different way of thinking about it. So I think the reality is there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat. Um, it's just a matter of what works for you and in your, in your period of life and you know what you can get away with. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, we did a uh, a show on her urban hiking, and you know, I was a little, you know, set back by it. I'm like, where urban hike? Why would you want to do that? But she made a lot of valid points in that episode about doing it, and uh, I can totally see it. You know, especially to start to get yourself ready and and see mm-hmm. if uh, long distance hiking is is for you. Plus, yeah, you get would... to see a lot of pieces of your city or your local area that you probably wouldn't have seen just driving through at 50 miles an hour. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's the nice thing about through hiking in general is, um, you know, it's a, a great way to slow down and reconnect and, and unplug. And, um, even like when we did that, urban, when we did our through hike of the Chinook trail, you know, we walked on a road for a half a day that I've driven on a hundred times to go fishing for steelhead. And, um, I had never noticed some of the rock formations until I was walking at three miles an hour instead of going by them at 65. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing what you can see at that speed. <laughs> yeah. At human speed, you really do get a lot more detail. So it's really great. Yep, no doubt. Well, I want to uh, pause and and take a little time or let you have a little time. I know you're sponsored uh, and you're an ambassador for some companies and some products. So I want to give you a little bit of chance to give them a shout out and give them a plug and thank them for for backing you as you're uh, as you're doing the CDT through hike. Yeah, definitely. Um, I appreciate that. I, I would first really like to thank the Continental Divide Trail Coalition. Um, I am their through hiker ambassador this year on trail. So I am uh, tasked with trying to set a good example for other through hikers when they're in town and on trail. Um, but it's been a great way to give back to the community and a great way to give back to the trail that has given me so much. Um, really like to give a big shout out to Mont Bell. Um, one of my big sponsors, they provide a lot of clothing for me. It's kept me warm and dry on trip and uh, can't thank them enough. Purple rain adventure skirts. Um, I know it sounds funny. I'm a big dude and uh, I hike in a kilt. And Mandy makes one of the best skirts out there. Uh, Gossamer gear, great packs. Um, Catabatic quilts out of Colorado. I think right down the street from you guys. Um, if nobody's bought one of their quilts yet or tried them, I highly recommend it. I haven't had a cold night's sleep yet. Uh, I got Tokes Outdoors, Sawyer Products, Backpackers Pantry, Yugo Bars, and Salads on Chocolate are keeping us fueled up. Um, my hiking partners are pretty excited that I have food sponsors because hikers love food more than anything. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, big shout out to Point Six Socks for giving me socks. I'm uh, pretty hard on footwear and uh, they've had to replace a couple pairs of socks after the desert, but uh, they've been holding up great through Colorado. Uh, Lucky Hiking Poles, Zero Gram. Um, and then back home, I know he's not with me now, but um, three long-term sponsors I've had that have always taken good care of me are uh, – Turbo Pup Meal Replacement Bars, uh, Barker Bags, and Ruffler Dog Gear. And uh, I'd just like to thank all of them for uh, keeping us going all these years. Right on. We definitely got to hook the dogs up for sure. They need their gear as well. Oh, yeah, definitely. 
<laughs> and all those and all those brands, you know, for the dog stuff, they all make really good quality products. So you can't go wrong with any of them. Yeah, absolutely. So tell me a little bit more about the American Long Distance Hiking Association. Um, what's the the goal of the organization? What is it you guys do, and uh, why should people come visit it? Uh, well, All to West is basically our mission is to promote long distance communication and fellowship among long distance hikers and those who support them. So our main goal is really one is social aspect. It's kind of the the family reunion you want to go to um, with your hiker family. So um, we have a social aspect of keeping people informed. We try to inspire people to try new trails. Um, we bring in speakers at various times throughout the year to you know speak and inspire other people to go out and try different things. Uh, we're the home of the Triple Crown Award. So those people who have completed the Appalachian Trail, the Continental Divide Trail, and the Pacific Crest Trail in their entirety – representing about 8,000 miles. Uh, for 21 years, we've been the home of that award. And we're the official organization that presents that award to people that um, apply for it. Actually, we just opened up the application process. So if any triple crowners out there who don't have a plaque on their wall and would like one, it's time to uh, go ahead and apply. Um, and I think, you know, we've really, in the last four years since I took over as our president, we've been trying to transition away from just a fraternity sorority so to speak of uh long distance hikers getting together and hanging out to really becoming more of an educational body um and trying to become the voice of the american long distance hiker and trying to help educate those that want to do a long distance hike to be properly prepared to go out there and be successful and do it right um we host rucks three times a year um a ruck is basically a workshop where we cover all the aspects of a through hike from ultralight backpacking to food nutrition uh, leave no trace and town etiquette, um, safety things. And then we have an open forum for people just to ask questions to long distance hikers and discuss, you know, their plans for a long distance hike. And, um, you know, membership's only $15 a year. It's a great organization. We put out a newsletter quarterly. Um, in there we have things we just had our last gazette just came out. You can check it out online at our website. Uh, we have an article there about whole food hiking by area's owner, we have a whole article there about um, trying to get long distance hikers and the American public to get engaged with their congressmen and senators and start, you know, lobbying for your trails, for the things you love to get your voice heard, to be able to help advocate for the trails that we all use every day. Um, so I think all the West in general is uh, for a long time, it was just kind of a, a party fraternity scene with the home of the Triple Crown. And now we're, you know, becoming a lot more than we used to be. <laughs> you're growing up huh? <laughs> we're growing up yeah we're, we're becoming adults and the other thing is we do honor uh a trail angel of the year every year uh we have the martin papenick award and um this is the sixth year that we're giving that award out and this year it's going to the andersons that are pretty famous on the pct for probably the last decade plus of taking care of hikers along the way um so it's a really fun organization we do have our annual gathering the last week of september um, every year this year, it's in Nevada city, California, September 29th to October 2nd. And, um, if you've never been to a gathering, I highly, if you're thinking about going on a long distance hike, it's worth coming to. If you've done a long distance hike, uh, you're probably gonna run into some people that, you know, and that is really the family reunion of the year. Um, kind of our signature event. We have great speakers coming out this year. We got trauma and pepper speaking about the great Himalaya trail Fireweed speaking about the Bigfoot Trail, Arizona is talking about the uh, the Hot Springs Trail. Um, and I know they got one of their talk, and for the life of me right now, it's slipping my mind because I'm on trail, um, and I'm not handling things this year on that. But we had a great lineup of speakers. We had the Triple Crown Ceremony on Saturday night, and it's just a really fun, inspiring weekend to come to. Yeah, very cool. Sounds like a blast. It is. Well, for people looking to get more information on through hiking and how to get started and uh, and more details about it, uh, visit the uh, American Long Distance Hiking Association West page, which is aldhawest.org. Correct. And, yeah, of course, in Colorado, I always have to uh, shout out, give a shout out to the Continental Divide Trail Coalition, which is continentaldividetrail.org. Go to any either one of those uh, sites and gather tons of information and learn, uh, learn about getting out on the trail yourself. So hopefully we've inspired people to uh to check them out and get out and try some of this on their own yeah definitely definitely cool so two things you mentioned there i want to dig into just a little bit uh yeah. you give a trail angel award explain what a trail angel is to some of those who might uh might not know through hiking okay so a trail angel is someone who's not a hiker but someone either from the community or a, or a random stranger that goes out of their way to 
to make a hiker's life easier. And it could be anything from a ride into town on a really hard hitch to um, taking you into their home and feeding you a meal and doing your laundry and letting you sleep at their house. Um, there's all different various ones. Most of the trail angels of notoriety have been people that over the years have hosted people at their homes or um, done water caches through the desert, things of that nature. And, um, you know, it, it takes a very special person who's not a hiker or who used to be a hiker to dedicate their time, energy, and effort to want to help people that are basically on a six month walkabout, you know, cause they want to be walking and, um, trail angels really make your life a lot easier. And it, it doesn't seem important at the time, but at the moment that they're there, it's the most important thing in the world when they're helping you out. Oh, I'll bet. <laughs> yeah. You guys do really, uh, rely on uh, perfect strangers while you're doing this because you can't, you know, it's like just hailing a ride into town to resupply or, you know, yeah. if you don't have a friend in the area, somebody you can call, then you have to, uh, you have to take that chance. And that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and there's some, you know, the CDT doesn't have a ton of trail angels, but, um, two in particular or three that have really helped out so far, uh, Nita, who's, you know, Nita LaRonde of the toaster house, um, down in Pie Town. She's been helping CDT hikers for 20 years. I mean, she's just went out of her way to make sure I was well taken care of, uh, Carla Rockmore down in South Fork, uh, Colorado, really just coming on the scene the last couple of years, helping out hikers. Um, she actually got her town, the community to buy four mountain bikes for through hikers to use when they're in town to be able to go to the grocery store and run errands and stuff. <laughs> That's um, so, I mean, that's a pretty awesome person right there. And she's taking some hikers into her house and letting them stay and feeding us dinner and things like that. And, um, let it be over in Pagosa Springs, just on the other side of Wolf Creek pass, um, almost a quadruple, triple crowner, a guy I've known for 20 years, met him when I was through hiking the AT. We hiked quite a bit together when he was through hiking that year too. Um, he's letting hikers stay at his house and helping them get rides back up to the pass and everything else. So, um, the CDT doesn't have a lot of trail angels, but the ones that are out there are all very solid and really going out of their way to make people's lives easier. Oh, wow. A quadruple, triple crowner. That's some serious yeah. miles. Yeah. He's done some serious miles over the years. That guy, I think <laughs> he told awesome. me he's like 700 miles away on the AT and 500 on the CDT from finishing it up. So that's great. Good for him. Yeah. Yep. So let's talk about Triple Crown a little bit. Um, you, I, I, we all know that a Triple Crown is, you know, somebody has completed the uh, the AT, the PCT, and the CDT. Um, mm -hmm. But how do you, you said you have to apply for it. Is this something you need to prove that you've done, or is it kind of honor system, or essentially people are like, yeah, no, I saw him <laughs> on the trail, and we all know him, of course he did. <laughs> you know, when the Triple Crown started 20 years ago, it was pretty easy for them to know who had done the Triple Crown because there was a lot less through hikers. Right. Um, so it was just kind of like people knew who had gotten triple crowds. They would just give them a triple crown. Um, as the community has grown and things have changed and different people have run the award, we've tried to, um, you know, verify hikes, but frankly, we're a group of volunteers. We're a group of hikers and, um, we don't really have time to worry about, you know, if somebody skips seven miles or not. So we do it <laughs> on the honor system. Um, we do ask that, you know, people just have continuous footsteps. So, um, you know, our feeling is, you know, if you hitchhiked, you know, 150 miles of a trail, you know, you probably shouldn't apply for a triple crown. You should know better. But, you know, we're not the hiking police either. So we do it on the honor system and we ask that people just be honest. We feel through hikers are pretty good people. And uh, those that are going to apply for a triple crown are probably the ones that, you know, are going to be honest about it. Yeah, yeah, probably. So to get the triple crown or to, to qualify as through hiking one of these these trails, do you have to do it all in one shot, or can you section hot uh, hike? No, yeah, I mean we don't we don't recognize race, you know, age, speed, you know, slowest, fastest through hike, section hike, flip flop. We don't recognize any of that. Um, we've had people that has taken them twenty years to hike the Appalachian Trail, and we've had other people that have done all three trails in one year. Um, so we don't care. We just want you to have completed all three trails and you apply for a triple crown. Oh, that's cool. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, maybe that's the rate that I'll have to get it. Maybe when I get, you know, about 85 and you know, I might've completed it by then. <laughs> well, I'm working on the second part of my triple crown and, uh, it's been 20 years. So You're I'm right? just hoping it's not 20 more before I hike the PC too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Otherwise I might actually get the record for the longest time it took someone to get a triple crown. <laughs> oh, whatever. That could be a one too, right? There should be a yeah, one exactly. for that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so this is your, is this your first time on the CDT or have you section hiked certain pieces of it? Prior no, this is uh this is, it. I came last year. I went to the first kickoff that they had in silver city. 
Uh, my good friend Shira was the uh, hiking ambassador last year for CDT, and I gave her a ride down to uh, the kickoff, represented all the West, and then came home. Um, so I had never hiked on the CDT before until now. The only experience I'd ever had in the Rockies was I went to Philmont when I was a Boy Scout when I was 17 years old. Okay. And besides that, I'd never hiked in the Rockies. I'd always hiked in the Cascades or on the East Coast right. or the Sierras. So you're working on the PCT currently. You do some through or do some section hiking mm-hmm. of that. How much of that have you completed? A uh, fair amount of Oregon and Washington and the Sierra portions of California. Okay. Still got a long way to go. Probably what will probably happen is I'll probably do a through hike at the PCT in the next couple of years. So how would you, you've been on all three, at least uh, good portions mm-hmm. of the PCT and CDT now, and you've, of course, through like the AT. How would you compare them? Which would you say is your, your favorite? Or um, I know they're very different trails. I mean, the ATT or AT is, uh, you know, pretty crowded when it comes to a, a through hiking trail and the CDT mm-hmm. being fairly rugged and, and harder to navigate, um, PCT sitting somewhere in between. So how would you kind of compare them and, uh, and contrast them? Well, I think the Appalachian Trail, the Appalachian Trail to me is the trail that I think everyone should hike. I mean, it is, it is crowded, all right, but it is also a social experiment to some degree of learning to be with other people and tearing down barriers and misconceptions. Um, and the people are what make the AT fun, actually. That social aspect is what makes the Appalachian Trail a really unique experience. But it's also the trail that's kind of the granddaddy trail. And um, all the through hiking culture originated on the Appalachian Trail. When Earl Schaefer threw like the Appalachian Trail, he didn't know what he was setting off really in motion for the rest of the world. Um, but all of the the terminology and the purism versus the blue blazer and the yellow blazer, I mean, all of that comes from the AT. So to me, it's almost like you got to do the AT to understand the culture of through hiking to some degree. Um, you know, the PCT is changing a lot right now. It's a trail in flux. Um, I think it's trying to find its way. It's it's nicer walking. The AT is really tough walking. The a, the PCT, I mean, it's graded for mules, so the walking's easier. It's nicely graded. It's nicely marked. Um, but you don't have the shelter, so you can have a total wilderness experience. You could hike out of season. You could do a flip flop and not have the crowds of the AT. Um, but I've seen the PCT culture in the last couple of years. Really, a lot of the AT social aspects are coming over to the PCT right now. Um, but it is nice walking on the PCT, I, the CDT, I mean, it's like comparing apples to oranges with the other two trails. Um, there is a trail and I was, at, I'm actually surprised at how well marked the CDT has been through New Mexico and Colorado so far. Um, I had visions of being lost every day and <laughs> I've been lost. Like there was one section where I got lost like six times in two and a half days, but that was either because I had my head down and wasn't paying attention or there was a bunch of blowdowns and I got confused in the woods. Right. Um, but for me, the CDT, the, the cool thing about the CDT is that it is really make your own adventure. I mean, there is the official route that is a line on a piece of paper and there is a trail you can take. Um, but there's also all these alternates and decisions and choices you get to make every day where you get to decide, hey, do I want to walk this alternate down the Gila River? and go, you know, through the river 250 times, or do I want to go up in the, in the black range and be dry and hot? And, um, to me, that's the fun of the CDT. You know, nobody's holding your feet to the fire saying you have to walk this, this six inch wide corridor, you know, for the next 2000 miles. It's pretty much like, Hey, you're going to go from Mexico to Canada through the Rockies and here are your options to do it. <laughs> this is roughly how you're going to do it. <laughs> this is roughly how you're going to do it. I mean, they say no two people hike the CD, the same CDT. And I absolutely believe that I've been hiking with the same guy from the start but there are days that he wound up going cross country one way or I got lost and wound up coming some other way where we haven't even walked the same trail and we've been together the entire time. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, from what I understand, your navigation skills are about ready to be put to the test to a, to some degree as you, you head north out of Colorado. <laughs> that is uh, what I've been told too, that Wyoming, actually Wyoming I heard is pretty well marked, but Montana and Idaho right. can be the bearcat of navigation for most CDT hikers. <laughs> Although, well, you know, it's cool, gotten though. a lot easier, you know, um, we still use the map and compass a fair amount during the day, but, um, you know, Goodhook and, and Jonathan Lay's PDF map app, um, just the two of those just make it pretty easy to find yourself on a map and then be able to take a look at the paper map and figure out where you're going from there. Yeah. Right. Right. So, well, carry it's the been proper tools fun. with you and uh, don't rely on too much technology. Right. Yeah. You know, I think with the CDT, it's one of those things. It's like, it is a tougher trail to navigate and get through and um, having every resource available at your fingertips is actually the best way to go. So when I mean, we got 
we got, you know, PDF maps, we got Gaia, we got, you know, we have three different GPS options. We got paper maps, we got a compass, um, we got notes from friends who've gone previous years, you got a water report, and it's kind of your job to take all that information and compute it in your head and decipher what's best for you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I think I think it's a more challenging hike in a lot of ways. It makes you think more, um, definitely pushes your limits a little bit more, and, uh, you know, it's it's a little bit, it's a tougher trail. Just at the end of the day, I mean, it really is. I mean, I think, you know, they say embrace the brutality and yeah, I mean, it's brutal at times, but it's also, it's so rewarding. Yeah. You know, that the, every single day you go through something tough, the reward is higher than anything I've ever had before in a hike too. Yeah. You're like, dang, I did that. Yeah. I got conquered that. I got through it. That's part yeah, of it. And just, you know? Yeah. And just things that are surprising too. I mean, New Mexico was one of the most diverse states I've ever walked through in my entire life. I was, I was blown away at the diverse ecosystems of New Mexico every day. Yeah. If you don't spend time down there, you just kind of imagine it's, it's very arid, you know, desert like, and it's, yeah. it's not, it does no. diversify quite a bit. Yeah. It's got, you know, mountains, it's got rivers, it's got giant old growth sycamore trees and cottonwoods. It's got these awesome sandstone canyons and mesas. I mean, it's just a really amazing place to go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I got to say, I was on your blog. I noticed you had the most ginormous, most disgusting blister on your <laughs> foot that I have ever witnessed. So it has to, begs the question: How do you deal with your feet? How do you take care of them? Obviously, you've done a lot of this, and you still got this this growth. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, um, I don't. You know, I live in the Pacific Northwest, so prior to coming to the CDT, I didn't really have an opportunity to go out and like toughen my feet up hiking because even if I did it was all wet they're just right. soggy you know they're just pruny um so I think the thing with blisters you know everybody has their own opinion you get a blister on trail 30 people are gonna give you 30 different opinions what you should do <laughs> right um my theory always used to be to pop every single blister possible um until I had a couple friends who were surgeons and they were like that is the worst thing you can actually do so my my feeling with the blister is taking care of my feet is um one, when we were in New Mexico, I tried to wash my feet two to three times a day. Um, you with, I just carry like a little blue sponge in a plastic bag and just use a little water and clean my feet. Um, I change my socks and try to rinse my socks out if I could once a day and like put on a dry pair and let the other pair dry out. Um, but when I get blisters, if they don't bother me when I'm walking, I just leave them. Um, I figure try to keep them clean. Don't pop them if they don't have to be, if they're not bothering you. And then elevate your feet at night so they try to reabsorb as much as possible. And eventually that would become a callus. Um, but if they do bother you and they are hurting you a lot, um, at that point I drain them. And then I take a mixture of uh, an iodine alcohol tincture and I cut a little slip with a pair of scissors and I drop it right down in there. And it stings like hell, but um, it will definitely keep it from getting infected and toughen it up. Mm, okay. So it's not so much trying to prevent the blisters as it is the knowledge to deal with them once you get them because you're going to get them. Yeah, I just think the reality is for anybody who's going on a hike, if you've been sitting at a desk for a month or three months or you, know, you haven't been hiking 20-mile days and you put on a pack and go walk 20-mile days day after day, you're going to get some blisters. That's just the reality. Everybody out here gets a blister at some point or the other. And um, yeah, I think just knowing how to manage them and deal with them is better than just thinking I'm going to prevent them 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, that thing you had, I, I swear to God, that was like a flotation device at the bottom. Oh, yeah. It had like, we, we, I mean, we were joking. And the thing is, like, you think that one's bad. Going into Pie Town, I got one in the arch of my foot that day. I did a 36 and a half mile day in a Pie Town. Um, and I got one the last probably 12 miles that was so big on the arch of my foot. I didn't know if I could finish hiking that day, but when it did pop, it was like, it was like orgasmic. It would felt so good when it finally <laughs> popped that day. Um, but I've, I've had some pretty big gnarly blisters and, um, yeah, I just kind of got to power through and, uh, you know, know that they're going to get better and turn into calluses and they have, I mean, pretty much now, my feet are just all calloused up. Yeah, so. I bet. I bet. <laughs> yeah. All right, we'll stop grossing people out and move on. <laughs> all right, I got two more for you. So sure. one, um, what's the best piece of gear that you've discovered uh, is invaluable on the trail that people wouldn't have thought about? Hmm. That's a really good question. You know what it probably is? Probably my sit pad. So I have I have a Gossamer Gear backpack and the in the back of my backpack there's a foam pad that's the padding but you can pull it out and sit on it 
And um, you wouldn't think that would be the most important piece of gear, but every single break for two months, that thing has come out and patted my behind to stay comfortable, whether we were in the desert or whether we were in the snow. It's great in the snow for insulation. Um, and it's just a really handy thing. It's it's easy to get in and out of your pack, and it's just a great little cheap, inexpensive piece of gear that keeps you comfortable all day long. No, no, that's a good point. I can completely relate to that. I, uh, my major hobby, adventure hobby, is uh, I think you refer to it, let me see, loosely translated as one of the American lazy hiking devices. So this is uh, <laughs> the thing with two wheels and an engine, you know. So I like oh, to go, go out, do adventure riding. and I, I Oh, perfect. There you go. I yes, I, because... I did refer to it as that in yes. my blog. <laughs> hiking for lazy people i call it that's right no i agree with you i do like hiking but if i have short little limited time this is how i go out and and cover a lot of ground but anyway point being is i do carry when i do uh uh, trips like that i do carry a tiny little chair with me because if you're at a campsite you know you're you don't want to be sitting on logs and stuff after be sitting on that motorcycle all day so i can relate to your sit pad yeah yep Yep, absolutely. Okay, so the final one, and then I'll let you go and uh, let you get some rest and get on the the trail for to, for tomorrow. But uh, all right, if I if you had to pick one favorite story of all the through hikes, all the adventures you've done, can you come up with one? The favorite story. Mm-hmm. Something good, something inspirational, something that makes us want to, you know, click off the computer and get out there and try it. All right. Well, it's kind of a sadistic story, but I'll tell you my favorite story. Oh, and the blister wasn't. This is not no. <laughs> the blister was child's play compared to this. <laughs> Great. So uh, three years ago, for summer solstice, me and my dog Carla uh, decided to take a trip down to um, Bull of the Woods and Opal Creek wilderness areas in Oregon, which are famous for some of the biggest old growth trees in the United States that are left intact. Um, so I drove down there on a Friday night after work and uh, we hiked in about four miles set up camp went to sleep got up the next morning at 5 a.m we were going to do a 26 mile day to some lakes and then the next day do a 15 mile day out to the car so we started going we got to the top of a mountain pretty early in the day and we checked and i checked the weather on my phone and i saw that uh there was thunder showers predicted for that evening and all through the next day with heavy rain and all and i was like i don't really want to be having to pack up a wet tent tomorrow morning and slog out in the rain so I, um, I decided to kind of shorten the trip and make this other loop over this other mountain and camp about five miles from the car and hike out the next morning, a shorter day. So um, ran out of water. There was a spring and a half a mile. Got in the pack after eating lunch, and we started hiking. I got about a quarter of a mile down trail, and it was pretty brushy trail. This trail hadn't been maintained or hiked on yet in the season. And um, so it was about knee-deep brush. And I came off a rock and I came down on my left ankle with all my weight and just thought, I actually thought I broke my ankle. That's how, that's how hard I came down on it. Um, and I actually screamed out in pain because it hurt so bad and, um, kind of propped myself back up and kind of went, Oh no, no, no. What am I going to do? And, um, got my breath about me, got my composure. was like, all right, first things first, go get water because you got no water. So I limped a quarter mile to get water filled up every water vessel I had, every water vessel the dog had. And um, I had so much fear that if I stopped, I could never start hiking again. Right. Once I got the water, we just kept walking. And um, got about another quarter mile down the trail and just got into blowdowns for the rest of the day. And when I'm talking <laughs> blowdowns, I'm talking old growth, northwest blowdowns. And um, <laughs> just one after the other, like every 150, 300 feet, there was a blowdown. And um, – Carluck was really awesome. He um he would run into a blowdown and turn and look at me, and then he'd like find a way over the blowdown, go on the other side and turn around and look at me. Uh, and if I didn't it, start man. going over the blowdown, he would come back over the blowdown, run behind me, nudge my knee. Really? Yeah. And then go back over the blowdown and wait for me. So we did this for miles and miles. And then when we got in areas where there weren't blowdowns and we were hiking, I mean I was moving pretty slow. He would come up behind me and nudge the back of my knee with his head gently to kind of keep me going. Um, so at the, so about 10 miles into the 13, 14 miles up to get to the car, there was a three mile descent and, um, my, my ankle was killing me. So I stopped and I was like, I got to put some kind of wrap on this thing. Cause I don't think I'm going to make it otherwise. And I opened my backpack and I pull out my first aid kit and my ACE bandage wasn't in there. Cause my wife and I had gone hiking last, the fall, previous fall it was my first hike of the season this year, and I didn't replace the ace bandage. I give it to her for her knee. Oh no! <laughs> so luckily, luckily, Carlo's pack had vet wrap, 
<laughs> so I slipped like the back end of my shoe off, used vet wrap and duct tape to wrap my ankle as best I could, and uh, started limping down this mountain for three and a half miles. And um, finally, we got to a Jeep road. We were able to get to the car. Um, but I, I fell on my ankle at 1230 in the morning and it was 845 at night when I got to my car and I'd only done 13 and a half miles. Oh man. And, um, uh, it was definitely the hardest, most painful day of hiking I've ever had. I was laid up for like four weeks afterwards. I had to go to the doctor. Um, they actually told me if I had broke, it would have been better. But the thing that kept me going the whole time was I had my spot in my backpack. And I was like, I can't hit my spot. <laughs> Not hitting like, that button. <laughs> I was like, if I hit that button, I am never going to hear the end of it from all my friends at home that I went out on a hike, like a gentle weekend hike, and I had to hit my spot because I busted my ankle. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so I just kind of gutted it out. And, um, you know, luckily I had the dog there. To, I mean, the dog, honestly, in that situation was like the lifesaver of the day. Um, so of all my stories of everything I've done, that's definitely probably the one that inspires me the most because all day long, I just kept slogging along in a ton of pain. I just kept thinking of like Ernest Shackleton and Douglas Moss and all the early Antarctic explorers. And I was like, those guys went through way worse than this. You just got to gut it out and make your way. <laughs> no, I get it. That's uh, I can see where that'd be an inspirational story for you. And I'm I'm picturing a bunch of listeners right now thinking, wait a minute, that's supposed to inspire me to get out and try that. <laughs> that can happen to me. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna sit here and watch the Food Network. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say the other the other uh, the other inspiring is you know the random acts of kindness that strangers provide for you on trail. Yeah. is worth alone to get out there. There you go. Um, just on the CDT this year, we came out of the Gila River. And, you know, for those who don't know, the Gila River is a beautiful canyon, New Mexico. But on the CDT, you cross it 252 times. And that water is pretty daggone cold in April when you're going through it. Uh, it's all snow melt and the temperature is cold in the morning. You're in a canyon with no sun. And it's, it's pretty chilly. Um, and you come out of there and you hike up to a mesa and there's a place called Snow Lake. And we were hiking up to Snow Lake. It was like a Tuesday morning, Tuesday afternoon. And there was one camper there packing up. And Buttercup turned to me in his thick German accent and goes, she is preparing the trail magic. <laughs> and uh, we rolled up. It was, there were six of us at the time. And uh, we said hi to her. And there was a random bag of food sitting by the privy that somebody had left. And it had like three cans of potted meat, Vienna sausages, chili chips, and a loaf of like a four slices of bread on a can of Spam. And we picked it up and we picked it up and we're like, oh yeah, we'll totally eat this. And the lady kind of looked at us appalled. And then she was like, do you guys want more food? And we're like, sure. And five minutes later, she was over there giving us shrimp cocktail with cocktail sauce, no homemade brownies and Munster cheese. And we just had this giant feast at Snow Lake for like an hour. And it was like the best trail magic I've ever had on trail. Yeah, that's cool. You're like, I'm not just, leaving this spot, man. <laughs> no, totally not. It was just like this total random act. And the lady was just super sweet, and nice. And, you know, it's just like she didn't have to go out of her way to do that. She could have just loaded up her cooler and just driven home with all that food and eaten it herself that night. But, you know, she went out of her way to make sure we got all that food and – uh I just think that was just a great, great experience of human kindness. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it is cool to know that people are out there. You know, we have, uh, we, we can end up being jaded and get such a, a poor view on the society and the world sometimes just because what we see in the news. But to hear stories like that, you're like, okay, yeah, people really are truly good. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing about this hike, I would say in particular. It's like, you know, I mean, when I ate, when I was 18 and threw like the AT, you know, you're pretty bright eyed and, and naive to the world and the way it works to some degree. And, and that's a great way to go through life too, to some degree. But, um, 16 years of working in the lumber business, sitting in a cubicle as a 100% commission-based broker, I got pretty cynical. And um, I would say the CDT has definitely opened my eyes up to, uh, you know, working with the universe, giving yourself up to it, and uh, kind of restore my faith in humankind and people out there. And it's uh, it's been a really good, life-changing thing. And, and you don't have to do it for six months, but you can do it for two weeks and, and get the same thing, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Well, if that's not enough inspiration right then and there, then I don't know what is. That's a, uh, I like it. Perfect. All right. All right, man. Well, awesome. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your, uh, out of your through hike of the CDT to sit down and talk with me and uh, man, get yeah. some rest tonight and carry on and be safe out there and have a blast. I'm jealous. All right. Thanks a lot, Travis. Appreciate you having me on tonight. All right, Whitney. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. You too. First of all, 
Thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun.